Why are Christians judgmental? Well, when you mean judgmental, what do you mean? Do you mean judgmental as in saying, well, look, real Christians understand the importance of holiness. The, the real Christian will understand why you have to live a life in fear of God. The real Christian will understand why it is essential to walk consecrated and close to God. It's not so you can feel, the, it's not so that you can abide by a form of rules. No, it's because you, you understand God's heart and you love Jesus and you want to serve Him with your life. And sometimes when you want to serve Jesus with your life, no, and all the time, whenever somebody really wants to serve Jesus with their life, when somebody is for real about God, they'll live a life that is in reverence to God. They have a fear of God and they want to stay away from evil. So people that walk consecrated and people that, that walk close to God, to the person that's either lukewarm and somebody that's very, that they, they don't hold God in a high regard, cause that's what it is. When somebody doesn't, doesn't have the fear of God, when somebody doesn't want to live a holy lifestyle and they still, you know, they, they claim to be saved and they claim to be a Christian, the problem with that is that they, by their life, the way that they live, they're actually showing that they don't fear God. That they're, they hold God in a, oh yeah, God, you know, he, he still loves me, he still forgives me. When the Bible says, fear God, judgment starts in the house of God. So this is a very tough reality and it's a strong truth. But a lot of things that many people go through, talking about lukewarm Christians, a lot of, and they're blind, so they don't even know where this comes from. A lot of things that lukewarm Christians go through can be the judgment of God because they don't fear Him at all. Right? The word says that judgment starts in the house of God. So if you're, if you go to the house of God, you claim to be part of the sheepfold, but yet you live a lifestyle that's compromising. You don't fear God at all. You don't walk in reverence. But all look, the reverence and walking with the fear of God, having the fear of God, it comes from a place that you've truly met God. You truly encountered you have you have truly encountered God. So because you truly encountered God, you've gotten to know his heart. You read the word. You read the word, and by reading the word, you get more knowledge of God. So you get to know how he is. So the more you get to know God, the more you're going to realize this is not someone that I should mess with. Just by reading the word alone, reading the Old Testament, even New Testament under the New Covenant. Judgment starts in the house of God. In the book of Revelation, Jesus rebuked many churches because those many churches thought they were doing the right thing. Jesus would say to the church of Laodicea, I know the good that you do. He would tell the church of Ephesus, I know you do good works. You love others. You treat others well. You call, you call out those that are actually fake apostles, false apostles. You can discern between the right and the wrong. You can discern between what's, what's true and what's false, the holy and the profane. But you've lost your first love for me. And to another church, the rebuke that they had was that they were lukewarm. Revelation chapter 8. 820, I believe. The harlot. The harlot. And what is a harlot? The harlot is the adulterous church. The harlot. What is a harlot? A harlot is a prostitute. A harlot is, is an adulteress. How? The harlot applies to somebody that, that, that is supposed to be married to somebody. That is married to somebody. But they go off and they cheat with other men. That's what a harlot is. And that's what the harlot, the adulterous church is referenced in Revelation 8. Let me pull it up. In other words, the lukewarm church is Babylon. It is referred to as Babylon in the book of Revelation. Chap Revelation chapter 18. After this, I saw another angel come down from heaven with great authority. And the earth grew bright and with splendor. He gave a, mi a mighty shout. He gave a mighty shout. Babylon is falling. The great city is falling. She has become a home for demons. She is a hideout for every foul spirit. A hideout for every foul vulture. Every fallen dreadful animal for all the nations have fallen because of her wine, because of the wine of her passionate immorality. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her because of her desires for extravagant luxury. The merchants of the world have grown rich. It's the adulterous church, guys. The adulterous church, the lukewarm church, the church that doesn't know how to be, the church that does not know how to remain faithful to God, how to remain faithful to Jesus. That is a harlot. That is Babylon. Babylon is, is the adulterous bride. So it's not that Christians are judgmental. Christians seem judgmental to the lukewarms. Now, there are forms of righteous judgment, right? But I'm talking about 
I'm talking about righteous judgment here. I'm trying to defend the people that are judging righteously. Because it says here in Corinthians, judge righteously. Here it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12. And this is the word of God. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders. In other words, the unbelievers. But it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside. But as the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. Why? Because the bad apple always corrupts the good apple. If you put a food that has mold, that mold is not just going to stay with that food. That mold is going to contaminate every food around the food that has the mold. It's not because we want to be mean. It's not because we're trying to be harsh. But it's because if somebody that's indulging in adultery or somebody that's indulging in some sort of sin within the church of believers, that person is going to go ahead and influence and say, hey, brother, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. <sighs> Try it out. You know, <sighs> don't fear God. <sighs> don't fear what they're saying. You know, you know, tu dale. You know, and that tu dale is going to cost you big time. If you don't fear God, Cuidado because the judgment of God starts in the house of God. You know, they say, go ahead, nothing's going to happen. If they say, go ahead, God will forgive you anyway. Be careful. Because once you go into that, you're already crossing dangerous territory. You're saying, God, I don't fear you. And I can go ahead and do what I want to do. And I know you're not going to punish me. When the word of God says that judgment starts in the house of God. Let me give you that verse. Look at this. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. And when judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will, ha what, what will, happen, what will happen to godless sinners? There you have it. We don't judge to condemn you. We judge because we want to protect the sheepfold. Jesus did say to protect the sheepfold from the wolves. And also, and those are, that are defending sin are the defenseless ones against sin on Judgment Day. You don't think God's going to remember what, that you defended sin? If you don't repent, God's going to hold it against you. And that's, that's a scary and that's a dangerous part. So we, we should never defend sin. We should never try to justify sin. In fact, everybody should repent and turn to God. It's that simple. It's very easy. It's, it's that simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. I'm going to push back. I'm going to give myself some pushback. So that way I can prove the point and clear it out for you. So judge not. So look, I'm going to give you a very common verse that people used to fight back on the do not judge. They fight back on it. So John 3.16. So you know what? Let me just start from 3.16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son. I'm trying to give you context. So this is John 3.16. I'm going to read from there on. For this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through Him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in Him. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it, for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light, so others can see that they are doing what God wants. In other words, it's saying, look, let me address something real quick. Many people will say that people reject the gospel because their demons do not like the gospel. I don't think that's biblical. I think the correct way to go about it is this. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. So it's not always a person's demons that's irritating when you preach the gospel. Sometimes they just don't want Jesus. It's not plain and simple. That's the light because the, the, the darkness, they love the darkness more. As in, they, they prefer things to be dark around their lives. They prefer the darkness. They prefer evil. They prefer the things of the world more than they do the light of God. Because when the light of God comes, everything else is plain. Right. And they don't like that reality. They don't like the reality that that is true. Right. So they prefer. They prefer darkness. They just they just don't love Jesus. They just don't want Jesus. They prefer to live in their own flesh. They prefer to live a life apart from God than to give God an opportunity and allow God's light to cleanse them, to sanctify them, to make them eligible for heaven. They don't want it. Some people just don't want it. And it's that simple. And it's that sad. Right. Pray for them, though. 
So look, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. When it says your judgment, let me let me read let me let me pull up another. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does but he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. So in other words, those that have truly repented and turned to God, they have no shame in proclaiming the gospel because they themselves are walking in the light, right? They're walking in righteousness because they have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. They have been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. They have been given the Holy Spirit as a deposit, right? So you're reading in the King James Version, in the New King James Version, it gives you more of the reality of what it is. But talk about judging, right? You notice how in the NLT it says judging. But in the New King James Version, which is a little more accurate, it says here, he, who, he who believes in him is not condemned. It's not about not judging as like pointing fingers and saying, ah, blah, blah, blah. No. Judgment. When Jesus talks about judgment, he talks about literal condemnation as in sending you to hell because God can do that. It says, do not fear man, for man can only kill the body. That's what Jesus said. But fear God who can send and destroy not only your body, but your soul in hell. So fear God, right? So judging in the case, in, in the way that Jesus spoke about judgment is condemnation as literally damning your soul to hell, right? So if you don't put your faith in Jesus, and it's not just talking about like, oh, I believe in Jesus. I have a sticker in my, in my car that says I love Jesus. That doesn't mean you're saved. What, what means you're saved is that not, you're not saved by works, but works is the fruit of your salvation. You understand what I'm saying? So you don't you don't work out your salvation. The Bible says, "Work out your salvation with tre- and fear and trembling," as in, do not fall away. In simple terms, what it means by that, what I think it means, do not fall away. Right? Keep the fear of God. Stay planted in Christ. Right? The enemy cannot snatch you out, but people can fall away. So condemnation, as in. God did not come to condemn the world. He could have. Jesus said he could have called 12 legions of angels before he was crucified to rescue him and screw everybody else up. Very bad. Destroy the whole world. But that's not what he came to do. He came to give creation another chance, an opportunity to be saved, an opportunity to have a relationship with God, an opportunity for creation to... To be with God. He knew that there would be people that would love him. He knew that there would be people that would give their lives up for him. He knew that there would be people, the elect, that would choose him over themselves. He died for the entire world, but God knows who will receive him and who will, and who will not. God knows who's going to make it to heaven and, who, and who's not going to make it to heaven. God knows the ones that truly love him and those that are pretending to love him. God knows. Because God knows doesn't mean that he's allowing it to happen. Allowing it, like, he, he doesn't make it happen. In other words, like, God knowing that somebody's gonna go to hell doesn't mean he wants them to go to hell. He just, he just knows that it's gonna happen. God gives people many opportunities, and God is fair, and God is just. God gives many opportunities, but people decide to say no. People decide to say, you know what, God, thank you, but no thank you. And in Judgment Day, God will replay that in front of them, and, and people will see, God, you're fair because I'm the one that rejected you. That's what people will say. People that are condemned. Right? I'm saved. I did, I, I received Christ as my Savior. I repented of my sins and I turned to God. Right? You have that opportunity too. It's a right that everybody has. You have that right. I have that right. Everybody that's alive has this right. Right? You lose that right when you die. So it's not about that. So it's not talking about like judging us and pointing fingers and, and singling, singling somebody out. No. In the context of John 3, condemn, judgment is referred as condemnation. God, Jesus does not come to condemn you and say, and, and, and Jesus did not come to, to, to destruct and destroy the world yet. That's in Revelation. That is in the future. God is coming as your Savior. Jesus came as your Savior to, to say, you know what? I'm paying for your sins because you're so messed up. You need somebody to atone for your sins. And that somebody is me, God in the flesh. Not only are your sins in the, from the past forgiven, your sins from the future are forgiven, and your current sins are forgiven. I came to make you spotless in God's eyes. 
That's the mission that Jesus came for. It was a rescue mission. Okay, so Jesus said, I'm not here to destroy the world. I'm here to rescue you. Whether you decide to accept that rescue or not is your decision. But not came to judge as in he came to give you an opportunity. All right, so let's let's check out the other verse that people usually get pushed back. So Matthew chapter. <clears throat> ah, yes, Matthew chapter seven. Matthew chapter 7. Judge not that you not be judged. For with that judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the same measure you, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck on your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me remove this speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs. Do not cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under your, their feet, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you into pieces. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, who was he talking to? This all goes back to the Beatitudes. This is a Sermon on the Mount. And seeing the multitudes, he went up to the mountain, and when he was seated with, and, and when he, and seeing the multitudes, he went up to the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, so, from Matthew chapter 5 all the way, look at all that, that is red, meaning that's all part of the same sermon. He's addressing the Pharisees. Because look at this, also in chapter 6, Moreover, when you fast, will not be like the hypocrites. Who's, who are the hypocrites that Jesus was referring to? The Pharisees. The Pharisees wanted to be seen. The Pharisees were clean on the outside of the cup, but on the inside they were dirty. Meaning, they wanted to show that they were religious. They wanted to show people, look how holy I am. Look how, how close to God I am. Right? But the, their heart, the inside of, the, of their heart, what they really thought in reality, who they really were, they weren't like that inside. Inside, they were filthy. They were full of greed. They were full of wickedness. They were full of envy. They were full of every kind of evil. That's why Jesus even called them. You br no, John called John the Baptist called them you brutal vipers, and Jesus will call them sons. Of, you, your son, you're not. Your father is not God, but your father is the devil. That's what Jesus would tell the Pharisees. So, from Matthew chapter five, look at it. You read it all. All of it is a sermon on the mount. And when he's talking about do not judge, he's saying do not be like the. Remember who is he addressing when he call, when he calls them hypocrites? Who is he addressing? He's, he's addressing the Pharisees. Why? Because the Pharisees would would condemn people. You're like you you don't. God doesn't want you. You know the Pharisees would would not allow people to get close to God. Jesus himself, he would hold people back. They, the Pharisees will hold back people from Jesus, saying. This man is a false. They, remember, they kept trying to accuse Jesus of being false. They tried to accuse Jesus of even being evil, right? And that's why Jesus addressed the Pharisees and saying, You Pharisees, you're the hypocrites because you're holding people back from me. And Jesus was God. So in other words, you're holding back people from God when you yourselves do not even know God. The speck in your eye does not allow you to see because you don't even see. So why are you trying to remove the log why are you trying to remove the speck in your brother's eye when you're even blind yourself, you Pharisees? In other words, why are you telling people that they don't know God when you don't even know God for yourself? You know what I'm saying? In other words, Jesus is not talking about righteous judgment. He's talking about unrighteous judgment. As in like, and let's say for example, if I have a gambling problem, if I have an addiction to alcohol, and I'm telling that person, you have, an, you, you have a problem. I don't like... The issue is that you have a gambling problem. The issue is that you have an alcohol problem. Am I the hypocrite or, or am I wrong for telling the other person that is also an addict just like me that they're wrong? I'm wrong because I'm, a, I'm wrong because I myself have the same issue that they have and I'm judging. I'm, I'm giving them judgment when that judgment is going to reflect back on me because I am doing the exact same thing. And it's not saying, do not judge righteously. Because again, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 does say, judge righteously. 
remove the evil person from among you. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 5 does say, Judge righteously and remove the wicked person from among you. Protect the apples from the bad apples. Protect the food that is not corrupted by the mold from the food that has a mold. Now I'm not saying if somebody is demonized or somebody is, is going through torment to, to shoo them away. No. Pray for that person. Love that person. Use discretion. Let, let the Holy Spirit guide you on that. Right? Do not turn somebody that wants help away. If somebody genuinely wants to be set free, do not turn them away. Give them deliverance if the Holy Le if the Holy Spirit leads you to do so. Pray for them if the Holy Spirit leads you to do so. Lead them to repentance if the Holy Spirit leads you to do so. Right? We are here as doctors among sick, pe sick people because Christ lives in us. The doctor lives in us. The doctor of doctor lives in us. The healer of healers lives in us. So, if we have the Holy Spirit. We are representatives of Christ. Christ was a doctor that was sent to the sick people. We are doctors sent to the sick people. We that have the Holy Spirit in us. You have to discern when it is appropriate to remove the wicked person from among you. The wicked person is the one that doesn't want to repent. The wicked person is the one that after you, you've you reprimanded them over and over, you brought it to their attention over and over, brother, sister, this is not right. You should repent. Get right with God. Do not do this no more. If they're still persistent, that's when you finally say, you know what? We, we have to expel you from, from, from our, our fellowship, our group, right? But if a person stumbles, what does the word of God say? Jesus said, the righteous man stumbles seven times 70. The righteous man stumbles 70 times. And a righteous man gets up seven times. Remove the evil person from among you that doesn't want to repent. But the one that does want to repent and is the one struggling, that one, love them, take care of them. The person is repentant. Use wisdom though. You know, Jesus also said, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Use wisdom on when to act and what to do. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. On everything you do. I'm saying the person that doesn't care. They don't give a hoot about walking close to God. They just go just, just to go to church. They just go to your fellowship. They go to fellowship. But they have no relationship with God. They, want, they don't want any relationship with God. They claim to be a believer. And they claim to do this and that. But they, they don't show a repentant heart. They're not a person that through God's own heart. Let the Holy Spirit guide you on that, on what to do. First Corinthians 5, remove that person from among you or pray for them. Let the Holy Spirit guide you on that. But in Matthew chapter 7, the context of do not judge or you'll be, lest you be judged is saying, if I'm an alcoholic and I'm condemning an alcoholic, I'm condemning myself because I'm struggling with the same issue, right? It's not saying if the Lord has delivered me from alcoholism and I'm saying, hey, God can deliver you. It's just the fact that you're deciding not to surrender it to God that is righteous judgment. That's saying God can take it away because He did it with me. That that is righteous judgment. That is that is allowed. In fact, you're supposed to do that. You're supposed to exalt the greatness of God and what God can do and what God has done in your life, and and shine the light, right? Shining the light is not judging. Shining the light is is for their benefit. The Holy Spirit will will detox the person. The Holy Spirit will do all the work. But a lot of people take it out of context and they say, do not judge. And they say, do not exhort, do not correct, do not rebuke. That is actually anti-biblical. The Word of God even says here, the Word of God is useful for our rebuke, our correction. Let me, let me pull it up here. 2 Timothy chapter 3 says here, if we're not supposed to judge, then tell me what this means. All scripture is given by inspiration by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete through equipped for every good work. So we're not supposed to, to correct anybody and we're just supposed to let people, you know what, do not judge, let him smoke, let him do this and that. And tell me what this means. All scripture says, just do what is true and what makes us realize what is wrong in our lives. Look, even, even clear, more clear in the NLT. Second Timothy verse, Second Timothy chapter 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives and corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. 
So the word of God is there to correct us when we are wrong. So when we are wrong, we have to be corrected in the sight of God because what does the Bible say in Hebrews? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. It says here, and we're not, okay, so first of all, and we're not supposed to judge. Think about judgment in the house of God. No, think about righteous judgment as a form of correction. It's a rebuke. A rebuke is saying, hey, this is wrong. You should change your ways. You should repent. That's all it is. That's all it is. Judgment is saying, hey, that is incorrect. That is not biblical. That is not of God, brother. You know, work on fixing that. That's the Holy Spirit to, 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 to drive you from that. That's the Holy Spirit to help you turn away from that. That's the Holy Spirit to sanctify you and to cleanse you from that. That's how it is. But people take it so far and says, you're judging me, brother. You're condemning me. And I'm like, no, it's a form of correction. Look, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Whoever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and you are not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, should we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? So chastisement, in other words, rebuke, in other words, judgment from the church, within the church, righteous judgment, not our righteous judgment, righteous judgment is for your benefit. It is to help you turn away from evil and it's to turn away to God and it's to turn to God. In other words, to lead you to repentance if you have to. It doesn't matter what it is. And that's the whole point of judging. No judgment is not bad. No judgment is, is, judgment is condoned. No, when Jesus meant do not judge, he meant as in do not judge hypocritically, do not judge unrighteously. If you're an alcoholic, judging and condemning another alcoholic, you're condemning yourself because you're going through the same thing. But if the Lord has delivered you from alcoholism, you have every right to tell the other person, hey, God delivered me, he can deliver you too. Repent, surrender to, to Jesus. That is righteous judgment. Right. So also to summarize, judgment is also you have judge righteously. You have to remove the wicked person from among you after a few rebukes. So after you try to correct that person, that person does not want anything to do with God, doesn't want to repent and still wants to be part of your group. The word says, leave them out, kick them out. Right. Because they're going to corrupt the mold that is on that person is going to corrupt the rest of the of the apples. And you don't want that. Right. I'm not saying that the person is desperate and is struggling and wants help. And wants to repent, but is struggling with strongholds in their mind. That's not what I mean. Help that person out. Love that person. Pray for that person. You who are spiritual, it says in James, you who are spiritual, restore that person. So it says here, somebody's been oppressed and they want help. They want to be set free, right? In that case, do not judge them. But it says here in Galatians chapter 6, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any, in any trespass, as in, if any man is struggling with any strongholds, you who are spiritual, as in the brethren that are in Christ, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So in other words, it's saying, use discretion, be wise. And the NLT it says here, dear, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, stronghold, and the NLT it says here, dear brothers and sisters, if we, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly, spiritual, you have the Holy Spirit living in you, you become godly, should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Sharing each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. As in like, you're not that important to not go out of your way to help your brother that is struggling. So let's say a brother, a brother is being tormented or a brother or sister is being tormented because this is a thing lately. People are being tormented by mental health issues. If you think you're too good, you think you're too cool, you think that that is beneath you to go and pray for another brother that is struggling with mental torment or mental health issues, you're fooling yourself. You're not that important to avoid that, to not go out of your way. In other words, do not be conceited. Who do you think you are to say... I'm too important to go pray for that other person that's struggling with, with, with something. That person's desperate for deliverance. That, de that person is desperate for help. That person is desperate for prayer. But I'm too good to go. That is what it's referring to here. That's what it, that is what is being referred here in Galatians 6. That is what is being referred here on Galatians 6 when it's saying you're not that important to not do your duty as a Christian, as a believer, to love one another as I have loved you. 
You're not that. You don't think you're better than others. Don't think you're better than than your brother that is struggling with the same that you're not struggling with. Don't think you're better than 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 the other brother that's struggling, and you're not. Don't think you're better with the brother that's that's dealing with demonic oppression. To don't think you're you're too good to go and pray for that brother. In other words. All right, guys. So that was that was the word. Subscribe button, hit that bell notification. Oh, need water. Jesus. <clears throat> Do me a favor, hit that bell notification. Every time we go live or upload a video, you get notified. Go ahead and subscribe. Comment where you're from. I want to hear where you, I want to hear where you're watching from. Do me, also, if the Lord puts in your heart to sow into the ministry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the cash app and the zeal down there. In case you want to sow, you don't have to sow. All this is free. But if the Lord puts in your heart to sow, a dollar whatever the lord puts in your heart go ahead and do so i'm gonna put the the information on the in the comments all right guys god bless you